Good evening. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to the second annual Arevut Lecture. The evening promises to be both highly entertaining and enlightening, and I am excited that you took the time to join with us. Before I continue, I would like to thank the UJA Federation of New York for hosting this event and for helping in its planning and, the de and for help in planning the logistics and the details for this evening's program. Thank you. Many of you are probably wondering who I am. My name is Ezra Tuckman. I have been a part of Arivut from its founding and currently serve as its president. I am extremely proud of my affiliation with Arivut and would like to take a few minutes to introduce you to this terrific organization, to its founder and director, Daniel Rothner, and to its mission and objective. Arivut was founded in September of 2002 by Daniel Rothner, a respected educator, community activist, and I dare say, visionary. From the start, the organization, its leadership, and staff have been committed to a single goal, to re-energize the commitment of our community's youth to the core Jewish values of chesed, staka, and tikkun olam. To that end, our Ivut reaches out to preteens, teens, parents, and educators, working with them to design and implement educational programs that combine innovative classroom instruction with hands-on, real-life experience. Arivut has much to be proud of. In less than two years, Arivut has already touched the lives of hundreds of students across the United States. Arivut sponsored programs at such, at, at such elite schools as Temple Anshe Shalom in Olympia Field, Illinois, the Kushner Yeshiva High School in Livingston, New Jersey, North Shore Hebrew Academy in Great Neck, New York, and the Heschel School right here in Manhattan have produced an army of young Jewish volunteers working on behalf of local and national charities and not-for-profits. Few organizations can claim to have positively impacted so many in so short a time. In addition to its successes in the classroom, Arivut has emerged as a force to be reckoned with in the world of online Jewish education. Arivut's website, launched in the spring of 2003, offers students, educators, and parents a wide array of educational materials, programming resources, and suggestions for volunteer opportunities. In little over a year since the site was launched, it has received over 64,000 users and has received over 625,000 hits. Million dollar internet companies have been started with less. Your generous support is critical to the ongoing efforts of Arevut and to the success of its mission. If you have not already done so, on your way out this evening, I would ask you to please pick up an envelope and demonstrate your support for Arevut and its critical mission. In that vein, I would like to take a moment to thank the sponsors of tonight's lecture. Thank you and Yashikov. Now on to the reason that we are all here. Tonight we have with us one of the generation's foremost scholars and authors. Rabbi Joseph Telushkin is the acclaimed author of several books on ethics, including Words That Hurt, Words That Heal, The Book of Jewish Values, and most recently, The Ten Commandments of Character. Rabbi Telushkin is a senior associate of CLAL, the National Jewish Center for Learning and Leadership, and is the rabbi of the Los Angeles-based Synagogue for the Performing Arts. But perhaps more importantly this evening, he is also a member of Ari Butz Advisory Committee and a driving force behind its vision and mission. It is my pleasure to present Rabbi Joseph Telushkin. I'm really re very pleased and honored to be able to participate in our reboot. I've been very impressed with Daniel since I first met him several years ago. I think we first met in Chicago, right? And we first met, and he's and his ideas in many ways there's such a confluence of thinking and his desire to really energize and re-energize uh, Jew Jews at the day school level with the commitment to ethics is so important and that's going to be actually the focus of my talk so I'm honored to play any role that I can in doing something for our reboot and the only, only other qu uh, request I'm going to make at this time is a personal one at the end of the event I know we're having refreshments and then I need 
to at least have a minion around. I'm still in the, I'm in the last week of a period of Chiyav, so I want to have a Myrav minion. And since I figured they might not have so many Sidurim here, I have these Sidurim. This is great, great novelty of uh, these tiny Sidurim. I don't know how, am I totally dependent on using this? Because I prefer to walk around when I speak and I don't want to walk around with this. Can I be heard pretty clearly? I'm easy. Okay. Uh, some years ago, when I sat down to write the Book of Jewish Values, which contains an ethical teaching drawn for every day of the year, what was motivating me was the following concern. One of the sad things that happened to Jewish life, I don't know if it happened in modernity, I don't know if it happened earlier, but was that the word religious has come to be associated primarily and actually somewhat exclusively in people's minds with ritual observance. And this is not only among Orthodox Jews, among Jews in general. So that if two Jews are speaking about a third, a not uncommon occurrence in Jewish life, and the question is raised, is so-and-so religious, the answer is going to be based solely on ritual observance. He keeps kosher, he keeps Shabbat, he is religious, she doesn't, she's not, from which one could form the extraordinarily odd impression that in Judaism, ethics are an extracurricular activity. Nice, but not that significant. I was speaking once, I remember, at a temple, and I asked, how many laws are there in the Torah? And a woman raised her hand and said, there are 613 laws in the Torah, but I'm not religious, I don't keep any. I said to her, I have two pieces of good news for you. Number one, about 100 years ago, one of the great Eastern European rabbinic sages, the Chafetz Chaim, actually put together a small book listing only those of the Taryag, only those of the 613 laws that are still practicable in today's world. Hundreds of laws deal with sacrifices, purity, and impurity, and can't be practiced. I said, in addition, on the assumption that you've not engaged in voluntary sexual relations with your mother, father, or any of your siblings, you've already kept three Torah laws. <laughs> and of course, the point I wanted to make was, we do a disservice to Judaism when we restrict it to the realm of the ritual. And I say that as a Jew who's passionately committed to ritual. I can tell you just three reasons. One is, without ritual, you don't have holiness. I know that there's a range of people here with backgrounds, so uh, I'll explain some terms, but I know that people come here with different experiences. But the truth is, anybody here who's ever had a meaningful Shabbat knows that the sense of sanctity in the Shabbat derives in large measure from the rituals. I'll just give you two thoughts that come into my head. According to Jewish law, you have to light at least two Shabbat candles at the inception of Shabbat. In how many of your households was there the minhag, the custom, that for each additional child an extra candle was lit? Okay, that's quite a number. I remember something I once heard from uh, Abraham Tversky. Abraham Tversky is a psychiatrist. He's also uh, from, he's a Hasidic Rebbe. And Tversky said his parents had that minhag. And he said, you know, when I was a child, it was very wonderful for me to know that because I existed, every Friday night there was more light in my parents' household. What Tversky is grasping there, of course, is that ritual often also speaks the language of poetry and can communicate that sense of sanctity. I'll tell you another tradition. How many of you, well, there are people here, how many of you who have children bless your children on Shabbat or on holidays? Okay. How many of you were blessed by your parents on Shabbat and holidays? Interestingly, as I go around the country, here it was pretty consistent, the same number. As I go around the country, it actually seems to me that there are more Jews today doing it than might have done it in the past generation. I think this is a mitzvah that's been coming back, getting more mazel. Now, of course, what is the tradition? You bless daughters by saying, may God make you like Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah. And boys, you tell, like Ephraim and Menashe, which, of course, raises the immediate shaila. What would you expect that the blessing to boys should be? If the girls are blessed to be like Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, so which, how should the boys be blessed? Like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, so why aren't they? Well, of course, the obvious reason is is because it's really blessed, based on a blessing that's there in Breshit, in the first book of the Torah, where Jacob really blesses his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. But the other reason, I think, is they're, you know, you're blessing your children. And as far as I know, those are the only two brothers who actually get along in Genesis. You know, what are you going to bless them? May God make you like Jacob and Esau, or like Isaac and Ishmael, or like Joseph and his brothers who didn't get along so well as youngsters? But anyway, 
I have a tradition. I always tell my children when I bless them something that they did that week that I remember. And it's good because as a parent, it forces you to think in terms of what you can say for the children. The only request I have is, can I just be bought like a soda or something, like a seltzer or something? Oh, good. Thanks. Thank you. So I, you know, so I always try and do that. Anyway, I was reading a beautiful essay by a woman named Naomi Remen. Naomi Remen is a doctor. I think she's out on the West Coast. And she grew up in a household which was not a particularly observant household. Her parents were very ambitious professionals. She describes it, she said, it was the sort of house where when I came home with a 98 on a test, my father would say, what happened to the other two points? And as Naomi Remen said, I spent most of my childhood and early adult years trying to pursue those two points. The great solace of her youth was her grandfather. She had a grandfather who was a pious Jew, and she used to go to his house every Friday afternoon. And her grandfather, when Shabbat would come, would light candles and would bless her. And when he would bless her, he would always tell her something that he was proud of about her. He would tell her when she was very little, you slept this whole week without the lights on in your room. As she got older, the blessings got a little more sophisticated. And she was an insecure child. She said, hearing what my grandfather loved about me made me view myself differently. Her grandfather died when she was right, quite young, and that was a big tragedy. And many years later, to her great surprise, her mother suddenly started lighting Shabbat candles. So one Friday night, and her mother was now in her 80s, she started telling her mother about the blessings her grandfather used to give her and how meaningful they were. And her mother said to her, she said, Naomi, I want you to know that I blessed you every day of my life. Only unlike your grandfather, I didn't have the wisdom to say the blessings out loud. So one of the great aspects of the ritual life is that it gives us, oh, to the rabbah, is it gives us a sense of the sacred. Then it gives us continuity. I'll give you an example. How, what was Abraham Lincoln's birthday? And what was Washington's birthday? We are the last generation of Americans who are going to know that. Now there's a President's Day, which supposedly honors all presidents, but ends up honoring none. It's, I think, the third Monday in February. It's a big day for schools being off and department store sales. Could you imagine if Jews suddenly got together and said, you know how we could guarantee a big turnout in Shul on Yom Kippur? Let's standardize it. Yom Kippur will be the first Sunday in October every year. Would more Jews take Yom Kippur seriously? I don't know. Maybe the first year, some people who don't come because it's during the week would show up. But the truth is, fewer would come because it would make it explicit that Yom Kippur is not really that important. See, part of the power of a ritual is that you have to adjust your life to the ritual. Jews adjust their lives to the holidays. In 3,500 years of history, Jewish holidays have never occurred on time. They're either early or late. You know, every year, you always hear the same thing. But the truth is, the power of the ritual is you adjust your life to it. Could you imagine if 3,500 or 3,300 years ago the Jews got liberated from Egypt and had never created a Seder? It would have been lost. This massive lesson that Jews brought to the world that God wants human beings to be free, but if we didn't have that annual Seder, we would have become dispersed and lost as a people. And third, rituals convey ethics very powerfully. When I was growing up in the 1950s, we did not have as widespread kosher supervision as exists today. Obviously, people were very strict about meat. But when it came to dairy products, when I was growing up, you were much more apt to read labels. My friend Dennis Prager once said to me, when I was six years old, the first words I learned to read in English were pure vegetable shortening only. He said it was not a bad thing to learn at the age of six that you couldn't have every candy bar in the candy store. So rituals are very important, but ethics got overlooked. As I travel around the country, and many of the audiences to whom I speak are not that Jewishly knowledgeable, I've learned that when it comes to Jewish, Jewish ethics, there are two terms that many Jews are familiar with, but it to some extent exhausts their knowledge of a distinctive Jewish ethic. One, obviously, is tzedakah, which is a term very many Jews know, and the second is lashon hara, which is a term also that has become familiar to many people. But beyond that, there's not a great sense of what's a distinctive Jewish ethics. So I want to speak a little about that. Animating me is also the notion of what I call moral imagination. Let me explain to you what I mean by that. When we think back to the 20th century as Jews, 
our thoughts tend to be dominated by a horrific event and a wonderful event. Obviously, what comes into our mind when you think of the 20th century is the Shoah, and then, of course, the creation of Israel, and then when you reflect a little longer, the extraordinary story of the rise of American Jewry, basically the transplanting of the sources of Jewish life from Europe to Israel and to the United States. When we think about the 20th century in more universal terms, one of the things we think about is the extraordinary advances in medicine, science, and technology. In the final analysis, each of those advances came about because an individual or a group of people used the full resources of their intellectual imagination to solve problems that previously had been thought to be insoluble. But in terms of moral dilemmas, human beings rarely use the full range of their intellectual imagination to try and solve them. What do I mean by moral imagination? I'll give you two examples drawn from rabbinic figures, and then I want to throw out about 15 suggestions, about half of which will apply to everyone here. I don't know which half, but they will. The first is a wonderful story I heard from a friend of mine, Hanoch Teller. Hanoch, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, is a rabbi who lives in Jerusalem, has written many books. He, his rebbe was Shlomo Zalman Auerbach, Allah Shalom, Zecher Tzadik Levracha. He told me a remarkable story that he knew of firsthand that had happened with Rabbi Shlomo Zalman. Rabbi Shlomo Zalman was not only a big halachic scholar, he was known as being an exceedingly pleasant humanitarian person, so people would often come to him with problems in their personal life. A couple once showed up in his office. They have a teenage son who is retarded but quite high functioning. And it turns out that there were two residential schools in Israel at which this boy's education could be taken to another higher level, more so than at the school that he was attending in Jerusalem. So they asked Shlomo Zalman, which school is better? So Shlomo Zalman said to the parents, well, which one does your son want to go to? The parents looked at each other abashed. It immediately became apparent that they had never thought to ask their son. He got very irritated. He says, Chatatem l'nefesh hayelad, you're sinning against the soul of your child. Don't you see what's going to happen? One day you're going to put your son in a car, you're going to drive to a school, you're going to leave him there, he'll feel exiled from the only household he's ever known. Go home and bring him back to me. Parents go home, they bring the boy back. Shalom Zalman says to the boy, Ech Korim Lacha, what's your name? The boy says, Akiva. And then before I tell you what he answered, because he had a very unusual answer, I'll tell you something about him. He was known as being a man of great uh, hum humility. People used to send letters to him. They would address it to the Oker Harim, you know, the uprooter of mountains, the, the uh, great light of our people. You know, and he'd get annoyed. He'd say, what do you want? The poor mailman wants to deliver a letter. He doesn't want to have to read a paragraph to figure out to whom the letter is addressed. Nonetheless, he said to the boy, Shalom Akiva, Ani Shlomo Zalman Auerbach, Ani Gadol Hador. Shalom Akiva, I'm Shlomo Zalman Auerbach, I'm the greatest rabbi in the world today. And he then said to the boy, I want you to go with your parents to visit these two schools, and I want you to see which school you like more. And when you decide, I want you to go to that school as my shaliach, as my messenger. You know about keeping kosher, you know about Shabbat, you can explain these things to people. And so that you can be my messenger, I'm going to give you smicha. And he gave the boy rabbinical ordination. Shlomo Zalman Auerbach was a man of extraordinary moral imagination. He realized that had the boy gone the way the parents were initially intending, he would have really gone with a sense of, of devastation. Instead, he went with a sense of such honor. Hanoch told me that the boy, it was hard for the parents to get the boy to come home for Shabbat because he had a mission. He had been sent by who? By the greatest rabbi in the world. So he had such a mission. Moral imagination just sees things in a different way. There's a wonderful story about Rav Shmuel, Rav Shmuel Salant, who was, I think, the, uh, the rub of the Eidah Haredit in Jerusalem like about 100 years ago. Two parents once come to him with a problem. Two, their two sons had left Jerusalem, and you know, we're talking about the ultra-Orthodox world, though the dilemma they had would have been problematic to anybody in the Orthodox world. It had nothing to do with their being ultra-Orthodox. Their two sons had gone to America and were sending them back money. But the parents received reports that the boys were not observant. And, you know, they were not hard reports to believe because in those days, if you're talking about in the late 1800s, early 1900s, by and large, when people came to America, they certainly worked on Shabbos, there was reason to believe them. So they asked 
Rav Shmuel Salant, are we allowed to use the money that they're sending us since for all we know there's good reason to believe it could have come from Chilul Shabbat? What did he answer? What answer could you imagine that he gave? His answer was a very interesting one. He said, you can use the money. And he said, let me tell you why. You've heard reports from a number of different people, so you don't have to just say it's Lush and Hara. You have good reason to think it's probably true. He said, so let's say your reports are true. Your sons really have stopped being observant Jews. There is, however, one mitzvah they're still trying to keep. Honor your father and mother. You want to take that away from them too? See, it's a whole different way. There's a, you know, you feel like you're standing on the shoulders of a giant and you're seeing how far you can see. So what are some of the suggestions I want to offer here tonight? It's drawn from a variety of areas. How many people here have ever introduced a couple who subsequently got married? Okay, are they still married? No, I'm joking, that's a modern question. How many of you have introduced two or more? Three or more? Four? Five? Six? Seven? Okay, fine. I once was giving a lecture. It didn't end. There was a woman who claimed she'd introduced 300 couples. It turns out she was a professional shotgun. To this day, I don't know whether she was telling the truth or she was trying to get business, but it was very, very impressive. Anyway, I have a friend who, it turns out, had introduced over 100 couples who got married, and, when he, and he doesn't do this professionally. And when he told me that, I was shocked. If anybody wants his number or wants to be in touch with him later, it's only if you only want to make a, a shidduch in the ultra, in the Haredi world. So, but anyway... I was shocked because, you know, how did he do it? Sometimes my wife and I will have guests for a sh I've introduced one couple who got married. Sometimes we'll have guests at a Shabbat table, and my wife and I will think, gee, we know someone for this person, and then we can't remember who it is. Then by the time we remember who it is, we can't remember who it was that we wanted to introduce them to. So I said to my friend, how do you do it? He opens up his wallet, and he takes out pieces of paper, and on them he has names of men and women and basic information about each, and when someone comes to him, he checks and sees, does he know someone who might be appropriate? If he does, he tries to make a connection. He'll add names onto the list. I learned a very important lesson from my friend. It is not enough in life to have good intentions. You have to have a system. I take it for granted that everybody here periodically has good intentions. Something happens in the course of a month and we think, there's something good I can do. But if we don't have a system to constantly goad us and remind us, we're going to forget. I remember when he told me that story, I thought, I had, there's a couple I'm very friendly with in New York, and the preceding year the husband had been on a Fulbright at Hebrew University, and so the wife had given, you know, he went back to his university position, but his wife had given up her job in PR, and now was looking. So I decided I'm gonna really make it a priority to try and help make a connection. It's an interesting thing, when something becomes uppermost in your mind, or high up in your mind, suddenly opportunities present themselves that you wouldn't have otherwise wouldn't uh, occur to you. And within two days, I was able to make two connections that proved helpful to her. So the first lesson I learned was it's not enough in life to, uh, to have good intentions. You have to have a system. I'll give you a second thought. How many of you, when you go to a restaurant and get mediocre service, not intentionally rude service, but mediocre service, how many of you reduce your tips? How many of you pretty much give your standard tip, you know, unless somebody's unintentional? Yeah, I, that, which is what I do, and then if the service is very good, I'll give a much bigger tip. Over the years, I've come to believe that the major issue in tipping for most people is cowardice. It's hard to look at somebody's face and not give them a tip or to give them a reduced tip. And what convinced me of that was there is somebody who does us a service that most people don't tip, and that's the chambermaid in a hotel room. Can you imagine not tipping the bellman? This guy schleps uh, the stuff up to your, uh, up to your room, and, uh, you know, and then you say to him, thank you very much, bye. You know, the rest of your stay will be afraid to go out the front door of the hotel. Uh, but most people don't tip the chambermaid because they don't see her. And I'll tell you the truth, for years I didn't either. It just never occurred to me. One day I was at a conference, and before leaving the conference, I think I was going to share a taxi with a friend of mine. So I went down to his room to pick him up, and I saw he was leaving money for the chambermaid. I said, gee, do you always do I said, was she particularly good? He said, no, I always do that. People always overlook the chambermaid, and I wouldn't do that. It's about five years ago, and it affected me ever since. By the way, you know who it was? It was Richard Joel. I remember that, so who was a very fine person. And uh, so I remember, you know, so it affected me uh, ever since. But you know what? It's not only good for the chambermaids. I've been speaking about this all over the country. I'm expecting to be honored at their dinner as the man of the year. 
But I don't only do it for the chambermaids. It's good for us. It is good for our own character to express gratitude even to those whose faces we don't see. Prayer obviously is rooted in the idea of expressing gratitude to God who we don't see, but even in our everyday encounters with human beings, the sense of gratitude towards those who help us. A third thought. There's a famous teaching in Pirkei Avot, Hevei kol adam b'sever panim yafot. Receive everybody with a cheerful expression. Who happens to remember? Who says that? Which rabbi? Shammai. Said by Rabbi Shammai. Now what's fascinating is, for those of you who are somewhat familiar with the sages, you know that Shammai, of all the rabbis in the Talmud, has the reputation of being a bit of a grouch. You know, it's funny that he's the one who says, receive everybody cheerfully. How did Shammai get that reputation? There's a famous story in the Talmud that everybody, at one time or another, has probably heard. A Gentile comes to Hillel and says, teach me all of Judaism while I'm standing on one foot. And Hillel says to him, what does he say? What's hateful unto you, don't do unto your neighbor. The rest is commentary now, zeal gemar. Now go and study. If you see the story, though, in context in the Gemara, what you learn is, is that that Gentile first went to Shammai and asked him the question. Shammai found the question so obnoxious, he had a stick in his hand. He was also a builder. He chased the guy away. Now, why was Shammai so annoyed by the question? Part of me is sympathetic to him. He'd been studying Judaism for decades. We don't know how old he was when that story occurred, but let's guess he was in his mid-40s. All of a sudden, after 25, 30 years, somebody says, summarize all of Judaism while you're standing on one foot. Does anybody here have a PhD? Are there any PhDs here? Okay. Anybody who has a PhD, by definition, had to write a doctoral dissertation. I passed my orals at Columbia. I never wrote my dissertation, you know, because it was daunting. A dissertation can be two, three, four years. How would you like it if after you finished your dissertation, a, uh, a few months later, somebody comes over to you and says, by the way, tell me all about your dissertation in one sentence. You know, so Shammai found it obnoxious. But there's a second reason why I think Shammai taught that, and this is what makes me so impressed with Shammai. The older I get, the more I find that the people I least enjoy dealing with are people who don't know themselves and don't know their own weaknesses. I find that as I get older, when you deal with people who don't know their weaknesses, it becomes maddening. You never know if something's going to meet with their favor or it's going to get them angry. They're inconsistent in their responses. You know, sometimes here, oh, he's a complex person. My experience has been complex people are usually people who don't know themselves, and they can drive you mad. I think Shammai knew that he had an irascible temperament. Hillel didn't. I think Hillel was one of those really easygoing guys. I'm not saying Hillel didn't have to work on his character, but I think it came more naturally to him. Shammai, I think, had to remind himself, you know what, you've got to receive people cheerfully. I always thought it would have been funny had that Gentile that he chased away with the stick yelled at him, I thought you said you're supposed to receive everybody cheerfully. But anyway, I was teaching this text once to a man I knew in L.A., and he said to me, that's ridiculous. If I'm in a bad mood, I'm supposed to act like I'm in a good mood? And I said, yes. I said, because unless you're in a bad mood because something really awful has gone on in your life, don't you realize that the people with whom you're interacting will probably feel you're upset with them? Every one of us in this room has had the experience of seeing someone who we know somewhat, and the person seemed to be in a bad mood. And we left the encounter wondering, are they just in a bad mood or are they somehow annoyed at me? And if that's true for us as adults, think about it from a child's perspective. How many people here grew up in a household where one or both of your parents was moody? Okay. I'm sure that was the highlight of your youth. I'm sure you wish you could go back and say to your parents, the only thing that was missing is I wish you had been a little moodier. The truth is, it's not a good thing for a child to have a moody parent because how el what else is a child supposed to think when he comes home from work, from school or something, and a parent seems upset? Of course a child's going to think it's my responsibility, it's my fault. I have male friends who are raised by moody mothers, and their whole lifetime, if a woman gets into a bad mood, they feel responsible. They feel they have to make her happy. Now, I know some women here are thinking, well, that's not so bad. But the truth is, it's terrible because it makes it impossible for the person to be spontaneous. If you have to always worry about the mood of the person to whom you're speaking, your interactions become false in many ways. It's painful. By the way, moody people get very defensive. They said, it's not my fault. People shouldn't take it seriously. But the truth is, moody people know it's not pleasant. No moody person ever took out a personal ad in a newspaper. Moody person looking to meet another moody person. 
Moody people usually when they're dating are able to disguise their moodiness because they know it's not the most wonderful of, uh, of traits. Now obviously there are people who can't. You know, there are people who have issues of chemical imbalances, but I would argue that those people have a moral obligation to seek out the treatments that can help them. In other words, if you walk into a household where somebody is repeatedly using four-letter words, it's unpleasant. You know, if somebody uses it every once in a while as an intensifier, you know, even there it's not the greatest thing, but okay, but you understand the force of it. But, you know, sometimes you'll see people really who, you'll, who curse a lot. It sort of pollutes the environment. It's unpleasant. But guess what? Moodiness does the same thing, I think even more so. Moodiness has an aggressive quality about it. If five people in a room are in a good mood and one is in a bad mood, that person often has a magical ability to spread that mood, you know, particularly in a familial setting. So human beings have a moral obligation to be as happy as they can be. Last we in last week's parsha, <coughs> we read what is presumably the most famous of the Taryag Mitzvot, the Haftal Reacha Kamocha, love your neighbor as yourself. What are some possible insights of moral imagination into love your neighbor? I want to share a few thoughts that occur to me. A number of years ago, Devorah, my wife and I moved for two years. We were living in Boulder, Colorado. And while in Boulder, I became friendly with Zalman Schachter. Zalman is the founder of what's known as Jewish Renewal. And one day I'm sitting with Zalman and I say to him, you know, there's something I'm embarrassed about. I live in New York. And very often I'll be in an intense conversation with someone and suddenly our concentration will be shattered by the sound of an ambulance siren. And I get annoyed and I know you know, nobody had to tell me. I know that that is an inappropriate response. Zalman gave me advice that has affected me ever since. He said, any time you hear an ambulance siren, stop whatever you're doing and make a prayer. He said, maybe make the prayer, the shortest prayer in the Torah that Moshe makes when Miriam becomes sick. It's five words, el na rafan Allah. Oh God, please heal her. I started making the prayer, and guess what? Immediately I stopped feeling annoyed. I had something to do. But within a matter of days, I became aware of the fact I was starting to practice via hafta, love your neighbor, towards somebody I never met and never would meet. I had to worry about somebody else. And suddenly, you know, instead of feeling annoyed, you feel, oh my God, somebody bad's going on. Can you imagine, God forbid, you're in an ambulance and you know where it's being driven, that people are praying for you? I once taught this, and I ran into a man a few weeks later. And he says, you know, Joseph, after your speech, I was on the highway, and there was a... Uh, there was a a car crash up ahead, and the, we got held up for 20 minutes. And I was, you know, usually in that situation, I think, oh, my bad luck. Which, by the way, is very ironic. That's how most people think. Somebody else is in a car crash, and they think, my bad luck. You know, so usually in that situation, I sit there, I get annoyed, you know, I make it unpleasant for everybody else, I come home in a bad mood. He said, I decided I would try and practice what you taught about prayer. And I really tried to pray for much of that time. He said, I don't know if it helped the person in the ambulance. He said, I know it helped me. I had to care about somebody else. It gave me a perspective. I'll give you another one drawn out of the world of prayer. How many of you, when you go to shul on Shabbos or on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, in addition to the prayers in the Siddur, how many of you offer personal prayers to God? Okay, say the large majority of people. Here's the suggestion. I'll tell you how I came up with it. I had written about 250 of the suggestions in my book, and I didn't want to repeat any one suggestion, and I was starting, it was starting to get harder to find, you know, find them, a discrete teaching. And I was at the West Side Judaica bookstore, and I ran into an old friend of mine, Rabbi J.J. Schachter, who's now, of course, in Boston. And he said, Joseph, what are you working on? And I told him about the book. I said, I said do you have any suggestions? He says, yeah, I have one for you. And it was a very interesting one. There's an expression that people very much associate with, with Orthodox Jews. If you see an Orthodox Jew and you say, how are you doing? What's a common response you get? Baruch Hashem. What is the origin of the expression Baruch Hashem? It's in the Torah. Interestingly, you know, you know how you find that you go to a concordance. You know, you look up a concordance which lists every word in the Torah. Who says Baruch Hashem? If I'm not mistaken, I know one of them that I'm going to say. I think Noach is one. I think Melchizedek is one. But the most famous person who says it is Yitro. Moses is Midianite father-in-law. When Yitro hears of all the wonderful things God has done for the Jewish people, he says, Baruch Hashem. And there's a teaching in the Gemara in Sanhedrin which specifically praises Yitro for this. You know, it's not like Moses didn't pray to the Jews cross the Red Sea, Az Yashir Moshe, but what's so special? So J.J. Shachter said to me, well, you know what's impressive? Yitro was praying to God 
for something that had happened to somebody else. He said that's what impressed him. He wasn't just thanking God for something God had done for him. He was praying to God for something done for someone else. And the lesson I picked up from that was I, or I, do my, I make daily prayers to God during, uh, during either my Shacharis or my uh, Shmon Asrei. Uh, pray, but I now, before I pray for myself or my family, I first pray for somebody else. I have a congregation, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur in L.A., and I asked the members of my congregation, it was a big crowd, how many of you are going to make personal prayers to God? 80, 90% of the people raised their hand. I said, before you pray for something for yourself, pray first for somebody else. And I said, and please don't just make it a prayer for somebody else's health. I said, first of all, nobody begrudges anybody their health. And I said, and we'll also do it during the Torah reading. But pray for somebody else's parnasa, somebody else's livelihood, when most of us are worrying about our own livelihood. Pray for somebody else's romantic or marital happiness when we all have our own family issues. I started doing it, and an important thing happened. You know, normally when you hear of a friend who's having professional difficulties, unless it's really like your best friend, usually we feel terrible, and then we forget about it. I started praying every morning for a friend of mine who was really having prof professional problems. And every morning, because I was praying for him, I was feeling very empathetic. And it motivated me, in fact, to do things to help him, which turned out to be helpful. So that's what I'm saying. Pray for someone else. I'll give you a third teaching relevant to that. Uh, what is the Sheva Brachas? What does that refer to? The Sheva Brachas refer to the, wedding, the blessings at a wedding. And also, what else does it refer to? To the parties that take place. In, in traditional Jewish life, you're supposed to have a party for the seven days following, for the week following a wedding. And at that party, there should always have at least one guest who wasn't at the wedding. And then during the Berkat HaMazon, the blessings after the meal, you, s you repeat the Shefa Brachas. Many people think that these parties are an ancient Jewish tradition. They were actually started 20 years ago by Jewish caterers. No, but in actuality, so at one of our Shefa Brachas, when Devorah and I got married, our friend Ruvain Kimmelman came. Ruvain teaches Talmud at Brandeis. And Ruvain gave us a toast. And he had a very interesting comment in the toast. He said... The Talmud goes out of its way to apply the verse, love your neighbor as yourself, to one's wife. And he raised the question. It also, interestingly enough, applies it to somebody who's condemned to be executed, uh, that you have to execute the person in the most expeditious manner, quickest manner possible, which makes a lot of sense when you also realize that at that time, you know, you had the Romans around who purposely were crucifying people to torture people who they were killing. But that takes me in a very different direction from applying it to one's wife. So Ruvain raised the issue, why does the Talmud go out of its way to apply via hafta to one's wife? And he answered, he said, I think the reason is this. He said, I've been at social events, parties, where I've heard men say things about their wife that they wouldn't say about their business partner if they intended to stay in business together. Yet if you ask the man, how can you speak like that about your wife? He'll say, oh, my wife knows that I love her. The proof, Ruvain said, of whether you have fulfilled love your neighbor as yourself towards your wife is not that you feel you fulfilled it, but that she feels you fulfilled it. This is a whole new way of looking at love your neighbor as yourself. Many of us think that we're loving people, but it turns out we often hurt people. We often don't take into account what their needs are. Now, at the time the Talmud was composed, women lived in a disadvantaged position in society. And so it's very impressive that the rabbis pinned this obligation on men. In the more egalitarian world that we now inhabit, it cuts in both directions. Does your wife feel that you love her as you love yourself? Does your husband feel it? I was once speaking to my friend, Dennis Prager. We grew up together, and we've been friends since high school, since our sophomore year at the Yeshiva of Flatbush. And I was once making the rather commonsensical you know, observation about what an important trait Hakara Satov is, gratitude, and how vile it is when people are ingrates. Dennis said something, though, that profoundly affected me ever since. He said, gratitude is not only a prerequisite trait for being a good person, it's also a prerequisite trait for being a happy person. And the insight, when you think about it, is profound. What's the mindset of a grateful person? Look what so-and-so did for me. He really cares about me. Look what she did. She really likes me. At the very moment that a person cultivates gratitude, what he or she also cultivates is a feeling of being loved. Conversely, what's the mindset of an ungrateful person? Ah, the only reason he helped me is now he thinks I'm going to do something for him. The only reason she spoke to so-and-so for me is now she'll think I'll use my connection on her behalf. 
what an ungrateful person reveals is not only that they have an emotionally stingy disposition, but how profoundly unloved they feel. Here's an example where doing the right thing turns out to be the right thing to do. Because as you cultivate gratitude, you will feel more love, and grateful people are not naive Pollyannas. It's actually ungrateful people who underrate the number of good people there are in the world. Ingratitude is the most self-destructive character trait. Forget about how obnoxious it is to the recipients of your ingratitude, but it is the most self-destructive trait. Because if you think of people that you think of as being ungrateful, I assure you they are not people you regard as happy people. So here, this is important. I want to offer two suggestions on how to stimulate gratitude in your lives. One is, I'll give you an example of something we do in our house. We go around the Shabbat table, and everybody has to say at least one good thing that happened to them that week. Inevitably, there are people who show up at the table who are convinced they just had the worst week of their lives. But the truth is, when you push people to talk about it, what usually comes out is, is the bad things, on rare instances, something really awful happened. But usually, it's a passing thing. It's not going to be something that's going to be making them that unhappy in a month or two months. Whereas, oddly enough, the good things, the sense of love and of relationship, are things that are going to nourish them for a long time. Okay, you didn't come here expecting to be involved in this exercise, so you can tell me any good thing that happened within the last month. Anybody have anything they want to share with me that's happened within the last month that they're happy about? It's been a rotten month here. Okay, yes, Rosalind. Okay, that's great. Okay, Rosalind, who's a gifted photographer, just did all the photography for the UJA spring campaign. Excellent. Okay, anybody else? A happy looking group here? Yes, back there. You have a healthy child. That's great, by the way. What's wonderful about that is, not only that you have a healthy child, which is certainly great, but what's wonderful about that is, real gratitude depends on being able to be happy over the ordinary. You know, people who can only be happy when the extraordinary is going on are not going to be happy because life is lived in the ordinary, not the extraordinary. You know, one of the great happy aspects of being a rabbi is you, have, you are disproportionately exposed to happiness. You know, there are a lot of simchas. One of the less happy features of being a rabbi is, is that you are disproportionately exposed to sadness. You know, not only in terms of funerals and things like that, but in general, people will often come to a rabbi when something awful is going on in their life. But one of the saddest things I experience is when somebody has had a real terrible thing happen, you know, either a death or a very bad illness, and they'll say to me something like, if only things could go back to being the way they used to be, I would be so happy. But the problem is I knew them when things were the way they used to be, and they weren't so happy. It's very sad when people can only recognize happiness when they no longer have it. So that's what gratitude can get you into. The second suggestion I have is a negative one, an activity to avoid. And I go around telling people to declare periodic complaining fasts. What is a complaining fast? Well, as Jews, we're all familiar with food fasts. Obviously, the most famous is Yom Kippur, followed by Tisha B'Av. In the Musa movement, they developed the notion of a ta'anit dibur, a speaking fast. We would go for 24 hours or 48 hours without saying a word. Most Jews prefer food fasts. But the, uh, a complaining fast is when you resolve not to complain about anything. And by the way, I, I commend it to you. It's a simple idea, but Einstein is reputed to have said everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. So this is a simple idea. It doesn't have to go simpler than that. Just for a period of 24 or 48 hours, don't complain about anything, and you will be amazed at how you will alter your own feelings about the world and how pleasanter you will make life for the people around you. A man once told me that he was lying in bed before he fell asleep at night and was reviewing in his mind all his interactions with his 10-year-old daughter since he had come home from work. When he came home, he went into her room. It was a big mess. He yelled at her. At the dinner table, she had bad table manners. He snapped at her. He then asked her if she had done her homework. She hadn't, so he got upset. After dinner, she did her homework, showed it to him. It had mistakes in it, and he got angry again. He started thinking as he was lying in bed, if my daughter walked into the room and said, Daddy, do you love me? He'd say, of course I love you. The only reason I criticize you is because I want you to do better. Then he started thinking, what would happen at work if his boss treated him the way he treated his daughter? 
constant barrage of criticisms. Yeah, of course I criticize you because I know how much better you could do. Would he really feel that that's what the boss really felt? Or would he feel totally undermined? He decided for a few days he wouldn't complain to his daughter about anything. And it put him in touch with all the things he loved about his daughter. Complaining is an addictive form of behavior for many people. I know, I'll tell you what often motivates me to start such a fast. I come home, I'm in a good mood. Had a good day at work, good things were accomplished. My wife is not in a good mood, she had a hard day. So she starts telling me about her hard day and at first I'm very sympathetic. But the longer she tells me about what a hard day she had, the more I start rethinking my day. You think you had a hard day? You know what happened to me? Inside of 10 minutes, we're each convinced we're leading miserably unhappy lives. It's remarkable the extent to which human beings can choose on what they are going to focus. I tell you, if you leave tonight and go home and decide for the next 24 hours you won't complain about anything, it'll have an effect. It'll have an effect. As I mentioned at the beginning, one of the Jewish, I just want to do a couple of more. One of the Jewish terms that has become widely known is Lashon Hara, you know, which refers to speaking unfairly about others. Interestingly, I think many people here are more knowledgeable, but there are people here of varying levels. What many people are not aware is that Lashon Hara is by definition true. It's often translated as gossip, but gossip, you know, connotes something that might be true, might not be true. Lashon Hara is true, and it's usually a somewhat embarrassing truth, it's nobody else's business. You're not supposed to go around repeating it. Now, here's an interesting thought. Most Jews think that Judaism hates the pig. Most Jews assume that Judaism really doesn't like pigs, which when you think about it is an odd thing to believe because if you were a pig, you would like Judaism. <laughs> Cows and chickens do not like Judaism. I once saw a cartoon showing two pigs speaking and one says, don't you wish the whole world was Jewish? Now, there's a famous sifra where the rabbis uh, say a Jew is not supposed to say, I hate pig, the thought of eating pig is disgusting to me. Rather, he's supposed to say, I wish I could eat pig, but what could I do? God has forbidden it. In other words, at least according to that rabbinic explanation, the laws of kashrut are rooted in the notion of self-discipline. You can't eat everything that you want. For people who are raised in firm environments, though, the truth is, Kashrut today does not inculcate self-discipline to the same extent. I would venture to guess. I mean, I know, you know, if I was eating and subsequent to eating a meal found out that somehow there had been pork in it, I would actually, I am certain, it hasn't, as far as I know, it hasn't happened, but I get physically ill. So I saw an interesting suggestion by Abraham Tversky. He said, you know what, the laws of Kashrut are in the Bible. They're obviously still binding but maybe we need to find another mitzvah that therefore can take their place in teaching a lot, some of these principles of self-discipline. And he said Lashon Hara is, should be the one. And here we come across an interesting thing. At which meal during the week do you think in many households the most Lashon Hara is spoken? Friday night, because it's the longest meal of the week. It's not, there's not a malicious thing. It's not like Jews say, I'm going to save up this Lashon Hara for Shabbos. <laughs> it's the longest meal. It's like the old joke. In which month do Americans speak the least gossip? February. It's the shortest month. Okay, so now gossip usually is about two things. Gossip is the most systematic violation of the golden rule against doing unto others what you don't want others to do unto you, because we usually gossip about two things. We gossip about other people's intimate details of their social life and their character flaws. If you were about to walk into a room and you heard the people talking about you, what you would least like to hear them talking about are your character flaws and the intimate details of your social life. Yet when we speak about others, that's exactly what we speak about. So imagine if during a Shabbat meal, when people were gossiping, if somebody said, you know what? I actually find it fascinating to hear about other people's character flaws. And it really is interesting to hear about the social details of other people's lives. But what could I do? God has forbidden it. That would be a lesson in self-discipline. I want to just mention two other areas in relation to children. A number of years ago, uh, PBS, I, I worked with PBS on a special about teaching of ethics, and they said, you know, Joseph, make sure you choose ethical teachings, since it'll be on PBS, that are as applicable to non-Jews as well as Jews. And I said all of these teachings are as applicable to non-Jews. The reason my book was called The Book of Jewish Values is because I root them, I try to root as many of them as possible in Jewish sources. But I said, there's one thing I want to teach on the show that if people forget everything else I said and only remember this, Dayenu, it's enough for me. 
And it's a simple suggestion I have for how I think we can improve the quality of Jewish life and American life. And I think the improvement, if this suggestion was widely adopted, and if there are any people here, I, I work by myself, I have no secretarial help. If anybody knows, anybody wants to start a campaign on this, I open it to Ari Vut, anywhere. I think this is, can be a worthy campaign. Because what I would like to see happen is a campaign to get parents to reserve the highest praise of their children for when their children do kind acts. Children normally get their highest praise for one of four things. For their academic achievements, for their athletic accomplishments, for their cultural achievements, and in the case of girls, for their physical appearance. A child who gets his or her greatest compliments for one of those four things is happy. Children, like all of us, need all the compliments we can get. But nonetheless, there's often a feeling that parental love is somewhat dependent on producing. And what about the child who's the real victim, the child who's not that smart, not that athletic, not that attractive? When does he get his or her greatest compliment? Oh, but so-and-so is a good kid from which it's immediately apparent that being a good kid is not that big a deal. It is one of the greatest ironies in life that human beings often get their greatest compliments for the things that to some extent were given them. Uh, you know, it's funny, I once heard somebody make a comment about a very wealthy person who seemed to be quite arrogant and said, you know, he was born on third base and thinks he hit a triple. And, uh, and the truth is, People who are very bright and have achieved a lot, they have often worked hard to achieve it, but to some extent they were probably born with higher IQs and greater capabilities. You know, and in the physical realm it's the same thing. You know how many years I've been doing Stairmaster? And you know that no matter how hard I try, I will never run a four minute mile. Four minute mile, never run an eight minute mile, you know. And there are others who can do it. So it's not just a question of work. You know, we commend people for these things and physical appearance there is no question that they keep your physical appearance you know to be a supermodel for that matter to, to do it you work you work hard at it but you have to have a certain basic God given blessing that you started with oddly enough people are less apt to be complimented on fineness of character which is a hundred percent the matter of free will where people have to work on really being considerate some people have to work harder than others you know Human beings are born with predilections. The only thing, people who think we're born as, uh, with a tabula rosa are people who don't have children. You know, you know, human beings come into the world with, uh, with definite predilections. But that's really, could you imagine if children got their highest praise for when they did acts of kindness, we'd raise a generation of people who most liked themselves when they were doing kind things. That's why it would be so transformative. I'll give you one other suggestion. How many of you grew up in households where your parents never apologized to you? Okay, a few of you, and others of you probably feel you didn't get apologized to enough, and now more hands are going up. I'll tell you an interesting story about that. A number of years ago, I mentioned, Devorah and I moved for two years to Boulder, Colorado, and I was invited to speak at the JCC, the Jewish Community Center in Denver, which is about 45 minutes from Boulder, and two of my daughters, Naomi, who was then six, and Shira, who was four, said they wanted to come to the speech. I didn't want them to come. The speech was going to be over their heads. But they said, Daddy, we know you travel all over the country. We know you give speeches. We want to hear you. So I bring them to the speech. It was a big crowd. I'm a very proud father. I introduce Naomi. I introduce Shira. Everybody applauds. They sit down in the front row. Ten minutes into the speech, I asked the audience, how many of you grew up in households where somebody's bad temper had a bad effect on the house? <laughs> Naomi's hand goes up, Shira's hand goes up. If you see how much you're laughing now, you can imagine how much the audience laughed when the children were actually there. You know, and they sort of didn't even realize what they had done that was so funny. Fi I was so embarrassed, I finally came back with the only comeback line possible. I said, unfortunately, my wife has a terrible temper. <laughs> but the truth is... Naomi was at a school in Boulder. It was a new day school, which at that time, things were not as great as we had hoped they would be. So I was, among other things, I was teaching her how to read. And according to my wife, the first time I explain something to someone, I'm very patient. And apparently I'm very patient the second time. But apparently by the third time, if I think somebody should have gotten it and they haven't, I become snappy. So I'd been snapping at Naomi. So after the lecture, I said two things to Naomi. I said, first of all, I want to apologize. I said, 
when you make mistakes, you're not doing it to be bad. And for me to get angry is wrong. Please forgive me. Secondly, I said, if I do it in the future, I want you to say to me, Daddy, you're not supposed to do that. Which, by the way, she actually started saying, which was very irritating. <laughs> but uh, parents who don't apologize to children are sending an awful message. The message they're sending is you only have to apologize when you're weak. Because parents make children apologize, and they're right to. A child who does something nasty and then doesn't say, I'm sorry, will become a nasty person and will get people angry at him. But if the parents then never apologize, so the underlying message is, oh, no, when you're strong, you don't have to apologize. What I just wanted to show in the last hour was just give a number of examples of how we can start to incorporate these ethics into our daily life. You know, and there are hundreds of them, but just look at the ones we examined. What I learned from my friend who introduced over 100 couples, it's not enough in life to have good intentions. You have to have a system. Tipping the chambermaid and the whole notion of expressing gratitude even to those whose faces we don't see. Why moodiness is not a victimless crime, and therefore you should receive people cheerfully. Love your neighbor as yourself and its implications, a number of them. When you hear an ambulance siren, make a prayer. When you offer prayers to God for yourself, first pray for somebody else. Does your wife feel that you love her as you love yourself? Does your husband feel that you love him as you love yourself? Why gratitude is a prerequisite trait for being a happy person. Going around a Shabbat table and having everybody share at least one good thing that happened to them that week. You'll think about your week differently. A good thing will happen. You'll savor it and save it up to be shared. A periodic complaining fast. Exercising self-control. When people start to gossip, acknowledging that gossip does interest you, but therefore you're going to try and still not do it. Reserving the highest praise of children for when they do kind acts and apologizing to children. There's a statement attributed to Rav Nachman of Bratzlov, which, and since he died in 1810, so it would be almost 200 years ago, where Rav Nachman is reputed to have said, if you're not going to be better tomorrow than you were today, then what need do you have for tomorrow? It's a brilliant insight. If we don't continue to grow, our souls will stagnate, and then we'll start to go backwards in time. And what is the point of our life if we're not trying to keep getting better? I once concluded a talk with that statement of Rav Nachman, and somebody said, you know, Joseph, that's a bit of a downer to have the last words in your speech be to an audience. What need do you have for tomorrow? So let me rework Rav Nachman's thoughts. I wish you a very good today and an even better tomorrow. Thank you very much. Can we do some questions or yeah, definitely. If anybody wants to comment or any discussion or questions. Well, all of them. The Jewish ethics of speech apply. You know, it's funny. There have been successful campaigns to get Jews to think in terms of Lashon Hara, but there is another whole aspect to the Jewish ethics of speech, on Atavarim, which is not to hurt people with words. In other words, Lashon Hara refers to how we speak about others, and on Atavarim refers to how we speak to others. And it's my belief that, as important as the laws concerning Lashon Hara are, more damage is done to people by how we speak to them. I have a feeling if you could listen in in a therapist's office, that more people will tell you of hurts that they suffered from things that people said to them, you know, than gossip that was spread about them. So there are a whole host of Jewish teachings in relation to that. Take issues of anger. How many people here wish you had better control over your tempers? How many people here are seated next to someone who they wish had better control over their tempers? <laughs> you know, I mean, that I find that anger is not thought about enough and yet is devastating. And it crops up constantly in relationships. I'll give you one suggestion on the issue of anger, that if you incorporate this suggestion, which is not the easiest suggestion in the world, but it's not that hard. If you incorporate this one suggestion, I give you my word, you will never again say something when angry that will cause a, a, a rupture in a relationship or a cause terrible pain to another person, irrevocable pain. And that is, no matter how angry you get, restrict the expression of your anger to the incident that provoked it. See, what happens is a lot of people, when they get angry, 
start summoning up everything that's ever antagonized them about the other person. They start using words like always and never. You're always inconsiderate. You never think before you act. What's the other person supposed to say? You're right, I am always inconsiderate. Or, unfortunately, I'm exceedingly stupid and I never think before I act. But in addition, it's immoral to do that, and I'll tell you why it's immoral. You think you have a right to be angry because they did something wrong and you're in the right, so you're occupying the moral high ground. But that's a lie, what you're saying. Nobody's always inconsiderate. Nobody never thinks before they act. If the only way you can establish your moral credentials is by lying, it lowers you. Criticism. Take uh, tochecha. You know, I, I, I suggest to people, if you're looking forward to criticizing somebody, don't do it. Because you're not going to be fair. The only people who usually can offer criticism are people who desperately wish they didn't have to. But they feel that they have to say something. So it's, you know, it's hard, in a sense, for me to answer your question in the abstract because it has to, it'll ultimately turn uh, on, you know, on specific issues. But that's what I'm saying. There are a whole host of ethics in Jude. I'm working now trying to write an actual code. Uh, it's a three-volume code of Jewish ethics. I'm working on the first volume, which is You Shall Be Holy, the Book of Character. And somebody asked me, you know, so you're basing it on the Shulchan Aruch. And I said, certainly, I'm looking up everything in the Shulchan Aruch that's relevant to these issues, but there's not enough to do a comprehensive code in that regard, and one has to do, in a sense, what uh, the Ramchal uh, did in the Mesilat Yesharim, which is you, in a sense, take a lot of the agotic material of the rabbis, and you say, what would it be like if this was binding as a law? Look at what I spoke about, receive everyone cheerfully. Now, as far as I know, actually, I think Rambam does, use, does cite that in, in Deo. But in general, I don't think there would be anything in the Shulchan Aruch that you have a, that it's a halachic obligation. In, you know, in general, uh, the, the strict halachic material dealt more with norms that, than with the actual enforcement of some of these traits or the development of it. And I, I just found myself, I wrote 40 pages just on material I was able to ascend on Havei Danet Kol Adam judging people fairly. You know, so that's the areas in which I think we want to go and these have tremendous applicability on the one-on-one. -on -one. Because how do you do it? We know that problems can come up in Jewish day schools. I mean, that's, in a sense, what Ari Vuda is addressing, where you can have Jewish day schools where the kids are extremely smart, but don't necessarily act as nicely as one would want them to act. You know, and how do you create that? I remember when we came back from Boulder, we enrolled our children in SAR, and it was very moving to me. I'll tell you two things that were very moving to me. My daughter came into SAR in the second grade. And, uh, you know, and she was shy. And it was a little, and, you know, that could be a little hard for any child. And the first day she came into the second grade, Rabbi Cohen, the principal of the school, came into her class and gave a talk to the class about how the most important rule at the school was, was that if any child comes into a group and says, can I play with you, you're not allowed to say no. Now, that's empowering because, I don't have to mention the name of the school, but I had had another child who was at a different school and had been excluded. And she said, you know, there were girls who were known as the kicked out group. And when we spoke there to people in the school about it, well, you know, we were told children have to learn. This is the way the world works. There are cliques, you know, and other things. It reminded me of a wonderful story a woman had told me. There was a woman who was a grandmother, but there was a one of the grandchildren was, a ch you know, was not actually her biological grandchild. Her uh, daughter-in-law had married in with a child. So it came time to just give out certain big gifts. And, you know, the question was raised, should she give that same gift to this sort of step-grandchild? And somebody was making the point to her why she didn't really have to do that, you know, and said the sort of thing you hear, well, look, the child has to learn. Life is not fair. So the grandmother said, you know what, life isn't fair, but I just don't want her to learn that lesson from me. You know, and so let's say the world really does have cliques, but you don't want them to learn that in a Jewish day school. That's not the way we're supposed to learn. Another nice thing was a Naomi that grade was walking with, my, with Devorah in the street, and there was a beggar, and Devorah gave the, gave the man some money, and they walked on, and Naomi said to her, you didn't do the mitzvah right. And Devorah said, what do you mean? She said, well, they taught us in school, you can't just give the money. You have to look the person in the eye and, and, uh, and then give them the money and say, God bless you. And so Devorah went back and did look the person in the eye. And she said, you know what? It's a very different experience. You look the person in the eye, you really do recognize the image of God. It's Salam Elohim in the person. 
So there are a hope, once people want to think in those terms, and I feel like I'm speaking here to the choir because this is, if you, by definition, I hope if you come to an Ari Vut event, this is the sort of thing you want to see. We, can, we have the capacity to reveal the richness of Judaism. I wish we would do that. You know, I wish, there are a number of ads I'd like to see us take out, like the ad of the storekeeper law from the Mishnah in Baba Messiah, that you're forbidden to ask the storekeeper the price of an item if you have no intention of buying it. You know, I would like, I remember I once spoke about it with my friend Effie Buchwald, you know, about a campaign if you just put up on subways, all the, you know, different ethical teachings out of Judaism. I think it would be very, very powerful. The other ad I'd like to see put up has nothing to do with Jewish ethics, but it's just somebody, it occurred to me one day, a big ad, what does every leader of Hamas have in common? And the answer is not a single one of them has ever sent one of their own children on a suicide mission. But uh, that takes us to a different. Now we can talk about other mitzvahs. <laughs> okay, yes, Rosalind. Um, you started out by saying it's not enough to get good Yeah, what I mean is, no, okay, what did I mean by saying it's not enough to have good intentions? You have to have a system. In theory, all of us want to, right, my, what was my friend's system? Why is my friend successful in introducing many people and others are less successful who might have an intention? Because they forget. He has a system. So, you know, but no, by the way, you can't do it in 50 different areas. There has to be some level of specialization because if you try and be a tzaddik in every area of your life, there's the old rabbinic expression, tafasta maruba. If you try to catch, your ever, cap, catch everything, you'll end up with nothing. And so, but, you but if you have a system, once you have that system, really try to systematically think through how you can do good. So you note it. You know, you note it and you think through, and what am I doing today to follow through on this thing? And, uh, you know, whatever it is. But you have to remind yourself to do it. And that's what it is. What's the system that will keep something uppermost in your mind, and then so that you'll know that you'll continue to work on it? And by the way, listen, you work as a photographer. So if you're given a job and you're told at the beginning of the job, by the way, there are these four people who you have to make sure when you're doing the photography about our organization that we have pictures of these four people. So that becomes part of what's in your mind. And, you know, maybe you even write it down at the beginning. There has to be a system so that you'll remember how to do it. If it was just mentioned to you casually in passing, and then, you know, you could easily end up forgetting. So that's how you, you make, what is your priorities and how do you fulfill it? Yes. Well, in a sense, the suggestion of putting it like that, by saying to people, you know, the truth is I also really am interested in the intimate details of other people's lives, you know, actually is intended in an almost somewhat facetious manner to make it apparent that you're not better than they are. You know, that you yourself share in that, but what can you do? You know, we're not supposed to do it. You see, it's a, very, it's a tricky issue. The prophets preach righteousness, not self-righteousness. And we're always afraid of coming across as self-righteous. But if we get too afraid to come across at all as self-righteous, we end up basically acquiescing. You know, because if you hang around while people are, are sort of diminishing another person's reputation, people therefore will think that you agree with it, you know, or think that it's not such a bad thing. Now, as, as regards offering tochecha, it is a tricky issue. You know, and I remember coming across something once in the Shulchan Aruch HaRav, which is the, the Shulchan Aruch of, of the Alter Rebbe, of the Lubavitch, in which he says there, you don't have to offer criticism if you have good reason to think nobody's going to listen to it. You know, in other words, if you're with a friend, let's say, who's acting in a rude manner, you're at a restaurant, and acting in a rude manner towards a waiter or a waitress or something, you probably can find a way to say something to your friend. But, you know, it's going to get tricky if you start going over to another table and say to somebody, you know, I don't think you're leaving a big enough tip. You know, at a certain point, you know, so therefore you have to, there has to be a common sense about it, but you can't sort of give up in advance. 
and we can do uh, we can do more good than we think we're capable of doing. We can be an influence. Yes. How do, you, how do you communicate to teenagers the importance of being a good person? Which is, number one, you have to speak about it, but you can't be overly ponderous. But just simply make sure that you do it. We have in our building, for example, uh, a very old woman who's a wonderful person, and, you know, and I'll often get flowers for her for Shabbat. But I'll insist, you know, you know, and it becomes easier that one of my children accompany me. It's not... You know, it used to be, I remember I used to, in the old days, I'd speak to federation uh, groups, or let's say others, and, and parents would raise the issue, how do I get my kids to be more actively Jewish? And one of the things I'd always say to them is, what's not a great thing is if all your Jewish identity is primarily expressed outside of the household, so that if you are an amazing activist on behalf of Israel, that's great, but your children aren't, you know, have to also get something in the house. Otherwise, it just becomes part of an idiosyncratic parental interest. So the question is, how do you get children involved? One of the good things is when children have a barabat mitzvah, to tell them you want them to give 10% of what they got in gifts uh, to charity, but give them a lot of latitude in choosing the charities to which they do it. You know, and, but have them, you know, say that you don't want them to give it just to one either. Can they come up with two or three different things? Things of that sort. Uh, you know, I, I think along those lines, that, that's where you'd start to do it. I think it's particularly important in issues of tzedakah because it's interesting. We need to make sure that we keep ourselves as a people who keep giving charity. I know this is potentially a problem in Jewish charitable giving that many very wealthy Jews of the past generation did not necessarily raise children who are going to be as generous as they are. And so there has to be models of the parental behavior. You know, it's interesting. A lot of those parents, you know what they've done to try and ensure that their children stay charitable? They've established big foundations. And interestingly, they want those foundations to be limited to giving out 5% a year because they want those foundations to exist in perpetuity because they know that it'll be more apt to keep their children involved in giving. So just to think when you do something that's good, is there a way you can involve your child in doing it as well? I remember at a much younger age, uh, my, one of my daughters, I found out that there was a kid who was being badly teased on a bus. And I sat down with my daughter about it, and I had heard things that were sufficiently disturbing, which didn't mean that she was involved, but she also wasn't stopping it. And I actually started crying. I mean, it was not, it just burst out of me because it was very painful to me when I heard what they had, uh, things that, people had said to this kid. And I remember I said to my daughter, I got married late, so I got married when I was 39. I remember my, when one of my daughters was in the fourth grade, she said, I can't believe I'm going to be 10 years old and my daddy's going to be 50, to which I said, thanks a lot. But, uh, but I remember I said to, said to her, I said, you know, I'm almost 50, and I said, if I tell you that it's a terrible thing to humiliate another person, I said, and don't use the word tease. Tease is a phony word. When kids tease another kid, that what they're talking about is humiliating. So I said, when I tell you as a 49-year-old that to humiliate another person is a terrible thing, I'm nothing special. Any 49-year-old who doesn't know that is, is a fool. I said, but if you can learn that lesson when you're nine, you can be a very great person. So I think it's that sense of appreciation of the goodness that, that can... Uh, you know, and children will just startle you. You know, my wife was just telling me today, we have a daughter who's 13, my wife was just telling me today, uh, you know, about the conflict you sometimes feel between your heart and your soul. Your heart wants to do something, your soul wants to do something else. And she said, sometimes, my wife was saying, it's hard to listen to the soul. Yeah, and my daughter said, yeah, I think it's because the heart often makes its, makes its wishes known in a clearer manner. The soul often doesn't speak quite that clearly. You know, and so there, there are whole ways we can convey to children our sense of pride in their acting in a menschlich way that will make it as palpable as the pride we convey 
in their report card or, or in other things like that. And, and they'll pick up when, it really, when that really matters to you. Again, I want to thank you. I think this is an auspicious event yet again for our reboot, which I'm excited about, and I think our reboot will just continue to expand. I know I'll be around for a little while longer, and I'll just reiterate my request again if we could at least have a minion around. At, I think we're having some refreshments now, so at the end of that, I need, I need a minion, but thank you for giving me this opportunity to meet with you all. Before we break, I want to thank again on behalf of Ari Vut, Rabbi Tulishkin, for his inspiring words. And everyone's invited to some refreshments, coffee, cake, dessert, and to spend a few minutes with Rabbi Tulishkin. Thank you again. <laughs>